Hello and welcome back to Film Exaggeration. Well, guess it's finally time to talk about one of the Olsen twin movies. Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen are probably the go to example on how to use your child's stardom to create an empire. They started out sharing the role of Michelle Tanner on Full House, and because of that, they became two of the biggest child actresses alive in the 90s, even having their own series of direct to video movies. By the time they were adults, they were two of the wealthiest women in the entertainment industry, and today are more focused on their fashion careers. And you know what? Good for them. They invested their money wisely and managed to avoid the trappings of many other child actors, and come out very successful and not do anything to embarrass themselves. So you may think I'm going to talk about one of their direct-to-video movies, but no, instead we're going to be looking at the last movie they starred in together, and in Ashley's case, the last movie she ever starred in as of 2020, New York Minute. Released in 2004, New York Minute was directed by Denny Gordon, who also did Joe Dirt and What a Girl Wants, and written by a trio that included Emily Fox, who's mostly done TV work, and Adam Cooper and Bill Coolidge, who would co-write the third Divergent movie that even I, as a fan of the first two, thought was boring. This movie was a huge box office bomb. On a budget of 30 million, it only managed about 23 million worldwide, and in its opening weekend made a little less than 6 million, which according to Box Office Mojo would make it the 13th lowest grossing movie for a wide release, aka over 3,000 theaters. To put that in perspective, Cats is number 19. Critically, it has an 11% on Rotten Tomatoes and a 4.9 on IMDb. Before this year, I had never seen the film, but I still remember the trailers airing damn near every break during the shows I was watching at the time. So does New York Minute suck as much as the critics said, or is it more enjoyable years later, kinda like Idle Hands was? Well, let's find out. I'm late. This is Jane Ryan, played by Ashley Olsen, having a very interesting dream. Ready for your speech, Ms. Ryan? Are you sure you were prepared this time? I guess the 90s weren't completely over by 2004. Eh, I guess it can't get any worse. What? <laughs> Whoa! That, that's, that's a naked teenager, just... Ew, 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 ew. One extreme zoom later, she wakes up and we then meet her twin sister Roxy, played by Mary Kate. And because they're twins, they have to be polar opposites, just like Sister Sister and the Sweet Life. Jane is the smart, organized Republican twin who has those things to cover the toilet seat in her bathroom. You can have those installed? Well, Roxy is the slacker, laid-back punk rock girl who's playing to ditch school to go watch a music video get filmed. And what band is the video for? Simple Plan Shoes. Simple Plan? Oh my god! <laughs> Look, I like Simple Plan, but that just instantly dates this movie. Their mother is dead, and their dad, played by Drew Pinsky, is a doctor, who unfortunately might not be able to make it to Jane's speech in New York City that day. It's very important to her, since if she does well, she could get a scholarship to an out-of-country university. So the two leave, but unfortunately a pervert is watching them. This is Max Lomax. Ha. Uh, played by Eugene Levy, a truant officer who wants to bust Roxy for ditching school too many times. Okay, we're just ripping off Ferris Bueller's day off. Roxy drops by her band manager's place, who I swear looks like Woody from The Sweet Life on Deck, to get some CDs to show to record executives at the Simple Plan shoot. And thankfully, they leave just before Max shows up to take in the other band members. Wait, wait, school hasn't started yet, right? I mean, Roxy still has to drive Jane to the train station. You're, you're, you're a truancy officer, you're not Dirty Harry. You know, this kind of crud is what kept you out of the forest for 25 years, you know that, don't you? Well, no wonder he arrests innocent white people. He's a terrible officer. Wait, what, 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 huh, what? what? What kind of editing was that? So the two happen to be the worst train passenger since the brainy kid from the Polar Express making loud noises, constantly arguing, but I will admit I did laugh at this part. Tickets, please. Roxy gets tossed off the train for not having a ticket, but because this conductor is the dumbest guy of all time, he thinks Jane is Roxy, despite having just thrown her off and Jane having different clothes. And he won't even let her show her a ticket. She bumps into a cute bike messenger named Jim, played by Riley Smith, and they flirt. Sorry. If you can't get out, I'll just take my skirt off. This is filmed terribly. One, two, three. Ah! Okay, please stop. This this is just weird. She's technically 17. So a limo driver sees an Asian man he's supposed to pick up, but the feds arrive to arrest him. He quickly puts a chip in Roxy's purse, and now... You're not John Woo. All of the taxis are gone. And, uh, you need a ride. I give you ride. 
What the hell kind of accent is that? Because there are no more trains for several hours, they decide to get in their limo with the strange talking man who tries to take her bag because they were apparently never warned about stranger danger. Yeah, Dr. Ryan, this is Max Lomax, Nassau County Department of Pro and See. I'm calling in regard to your daughter, Roxanne. Okay, dude, you have her. Her dad will find the message, you'll find out she skipped, she'll get in trouble, boom. Bad girl, bad girl. What you gonna do? What you gonna do when I come for you? Bad girl, bad girl. What you gonna do? <laughs> you know, I kinda like this guy. I mean, he just goes all in, and I respect that. The limo driver is named Benny, played by Andy Ritger, the adopted son of a Chinese woman who apparently runs some kind of crime ring. Yes, have the white guy constantly try and talk like an Asian. That's not a little bit racist. And he really needs that chip. Okay, we get it. You know how to use editing software. Please stop. And then we get this scene. This scene. This scene is just one of the dumbest things I've seen in a while. Okay, follow me. He locks the doors. They start screaming, but no one can hear them. They manage to escape the limo through the sunroof because Benny was stupid enough to not realize they could escape through the sunroof. They run, we get some more bad editing, and through this whole time, they don't try and ask for help. I mean, I know it's New York, but I assume at least one person will help out these two little white girls if they scream a man is trying to kidnap them. They go into a completely empty subway, which bullshit, and somehow he got there before them. How the fuck did he get there before them? Wow. This villain is lame. Jane breaks her heels because girls, and then a bum tosses a slushie on her. That is not just a cherry slurpee. I smell alcohol. Some more stuff with Max just being something else. Now we're cooking with gas. Come on, folks. Is it bad I kind of want him to win? They go into a small store to change where they meet what I assume is a racist stereotype. She has a whole life ahead of her. She should not be drinking this time of day. But ew, the bathroom is dirty. Go find another bathroom. You're in New York City. I'm sure you can find one. Roxy finds the message Max left for their dad and then erases it. How the hell did you do that? I don't remember that technology. This is just reminding me of that shit Kevin pulled off in Bigger Fatter Liar. They try to pay, but Roxy's out of cash and Jane left her planner with her cards and speech in the limo. They head for a hotel. Checking in, ladies. We're with the band. Yeah. Like oh, well then. Oh, so we're just in stupid world. Okay. Benny goes to his mother, and it's here we learn why the chip is so important. What's so important about this stupid chip anyway? That stupid chip contains millions of dollars in pirated music. Wow. Even for the mid-2000s, trying to make millions off of pirated music is a lame villain scheme. Just... Holy shit. The girls sneak into a hotel room. <laughs> Now. You know, just because you use slow motion doesn't make it exciting. Well. Oh god. That is the ugliest dog I've ever seen. Benny calls them and they agree to meet at the plaza in a half hour to trade. Then another cute boy comes in named Trey, played by Jared Padalecki. I've never seen Supernatural, so put in your own reference. Uh. Okay, dude, she's still in high school. The dog eats the chip because Plot and the woman whose room it is, a senator that also happens to be Trey's mom, announces she's coming back up. They toss the dog around and, you know, for all this movie's flaws, it's all worth it for this one scene. You take him! <laughs> there is some magic left in the world. Don't worry, the dog's fine. His name's Ronaldo, by the way. Then all the shenanigans happen. The two go out on the ledge on a towel. Trey tells his mom that he took the dog to the groomers. And of course, there's one of those window washer things. And they fall on bad green screen. Don't worry, they're fine. Although one of them loses a towel. Stop, that is legit kinda creepy. <laughs> New York City the most populated city in the country, and these two just happen to run into each other. What are the 
Fucking odds. Remember that episode of That's So Raven where Chelsea stole a goat and it eats Raven's tickets and they have to wait for it to take a shit? Yeah, that's the premise of the movie now. More annoying editing. It's Okay, if I didn't know who Bob Seg is, I would have no idea what the point of that was. They get some clothes in exchange for a watch, and the two then decide to part ways. Fox, I'll be fine. In front of the plaza, there's a lot of witnesses. Yeah, there were a lot of witnesses earlier. Didn't seem to do much help. Go to the fucking police! Oh, thank God, Max. Hey, where do you think you're going? I'm on a case, Einstein. Where do you think you're going? What do you mean? Uh, I'm not going anywhere. So we're clear on that. Huh? Can we please have this guy in every scene? Jane takes Ronaldo to Benny and tells him that she ate it. You give me my chip or I'll kill you. Cough it up, pooch. <laughs> you know, sometimes the movie is just so weird that I can't help but laugh. But then you get stupid shit like the dog pissing on him. Jane runs and Roxy gets into the simple plan shoot, but for some reason, Trey can't. I mean, he's the son of a senator. Can he just buy his way in? Jane shows up just in time for the band to play their song, Vacation. <laughs> this song, although, as far as I could tell, there's no official music video for it. Why? You have the band, you have the cameras, just shoot a video here. Roxy gives some of her CDs to two agents and they take them. Well, that was easy. Check your phone. What's that? Okay, that would be stupid, but then we get this. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I have to get by. Where do you think you're going? You may want to check your fly. That not only made the joke work, but made it ten times funnier. Is there no security? The two crowd surf to escape from both Max and Benny, who just showed up, and then we get this. I'm not! <laughs> In your darkest moments, just remember that scene. Benny kidnaps Trey because, like Roxy, he was stupid enough to get into a car with a weird stranger. You two are meant for each other. Can I help you? We are still not in Kansas anymore. What? Oh yeah, black people, just as weird as munchkins. What the fuck? Oh god, she's been transformed into Paris Hilton. Oh, uh, for those of you too young to remember, Paris Hilton was basically the Kylie Jenner of the 2000s. Benny calls and tells them to meet him in Times Square, and they ask the black people for a ride, to which they just give them the keys to a taxi, okay. Cease and desist! Who's that cracker? What the fuck? Oh, and guess who gets in the taxi? The rule book, I know what red means. Hi, I need to go to 112. Go! I'm not even questioning how far-fetched that is because it's just so beautiful. Max commandeers an RV with the most oblivious but adorable old couple since Popstar, and we get a chase scene. This chase scene is okay, but all I'm thinking through this is, where the hell are the police? <laughs> yeah, you know they say it's a city that never sleeps. Oh, I think it will now that you've hit town, Gomer. And Max was the original OK Boomer guy. How is this character not more famous? The chase ends with them getting away as the two girls fight, and you know, I'm not saying Jane doesn't have her flaws, but I am pretty much on her side. It's Roxy's fault they got kicked off the train. You wanna know why I went this fellowship abroad? Because it's 3,000 miles away from you. So the two girls separate and we get our sad montage. Little girls are ninjas! Benny decides to kidnap Jane and Ronaldo and hold them hostage. You know, these Chinese music piraters went to kidnapping pretty quickly. You're not 24! Roxy finds Jane's planner and also Trey locked in the trunk. So they head for where the speech is happening. As Benny tries to make the dog take a shit, Jane realizes all the pirated media they have. These are the lamest criminals ever! Jane escapes and her and Ronaldo run off. <laughs> Stranger? Oh, come the fuck on! As they have a chase scene that involves Jim going over cars, so... 
he's losing his job. Roxy takes Jane's place at the speech. Yeah, that's a nice gesture, but your sister could be dead. Unfortunately, she drops the cards, leading to the most cringe speech I've seen in a while. Why'd you have to go and make things so complicated? I see the way you're acting like you're somebody else. It gets me frustrated. Life's like this, you fall, and you crawl, and you break, and you take what you can get, turn it into honesty, and promise me I'm never gonna find you fake it. Could she make it any more obvious that she doesn't know what the hell she's talking about? By the way, both Trey's mom and the guy they tortured on the train and taxi are both judges. Jane eventually does show up, though. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's all the time I have for them. In any rational world, she would be disqualified, but they don't even have time for that as all the characters show up. Officer! Arrest that man! Yes, ma'am. Oh, my baby! Why? Every time. It's just the magic. Max takes down Benny as Jane explains their evil scheme. See this guy over here are criminals dealing in pirated music, movies, and probably Gucci handbags. Officer Lomax, who tracked down the Bang family and wouldn't rest until justice was served. So they're standing up for Max? Okay. The two girls make up and it's all cute and shit. Jay never actually gives her speech, but at least that old couple liked it. Else, wasn't it? Oh, honey, I loved it. I loved it. Yes, we gotta, come on. We gotta give it up for the cat. Actually, no, this is better than the Cats movie. Jane does end up getting the Fellowship because the guy they continually tortured found her note cards. So fuck you, other kids who got there on time and actually gave your speech. Wait a minute. Jane said she wanted to go to Oxford because she wanted to get away from Roxy, but they're friends now. Wouldn't it be more powerful if she turned it down to show that she's choosing being close to her sister over a school? And Roxy and her band later get a record deal. So these two white bitches got everything they wanted. The scholarship, the record deal, the boys, and get no repercussions. And Max becomes a police officer. You know what, I'm okay with this. In fact, I'm so okay with this that I'm willing to forgive the girls getting everything handed to them because it allowed Max to get his dream. Although, Roxy, your band's song sucks. Nope. Oh, don't get me wrong. This movie's dumb. It's stupid, cliche, and has some very questionable moments, but for its intended demographic, it's fine. Tween girls at the time could have gotten some laughs, identified with the leads, and it's mostly harmless. Now as a 27-year-old man watching this in 2020, is there anything I enjoyed? Well, I do like the Max character, and I kinda got a nostalgia kick out of the very early to mid-2000s aesthetic. It is totally drenched in that time period. Don't get me wrong, it's a bad movie, and I don't expect most people to like it, and I don't even know if I would say I actually liked it. But I did have fun. If you're a fan of the Olsen twins or have a soft spot for the late 90s to mid 2000s teen movie, then there are far worse things you can do with your time. If you think you'll enjoy it given the stuff you've seen in this review, give it a shot. So, thank you all for watching, and I will see you next time. Bye. It's a visky, your landlord. You're two weeks late in a rent, Lomax. You'll get your rent when you fix this damn door!